Welcome to this episode of Horrific History and Hauntings. I'm Beth. And I'm Ramey. We are your host, here to talk about the stories that the history books ignore. From horrific epidemics and ghostly hauntings to the catastrophes and tragic events that have sickened humanity. Beth, what are we talking about today? I am going to call it the alphabet of death because I didn't get to do the episode that I had started research on. Not going to say what it's about, but the research was taking a lot longer, so I needed to come up with something quick to talk about for this week. I think I've seen a series called the ABCs of Death one time. It's about a bunch of murders. Yes. This is what I'm going to do when I need more time to research something that's going to take a little longer in between. Kind of like a little mini series, I guess you would say. And I only went through A and B for this one because I've been busy. We have an Amazon affiliate link if you would like to purchase the book I used for a lot of the research for this episode. It is called Final Exits, the Illustrated Encyclopedia of How We Die by Michael Largo. At the time of us recording this episode, the paperback is $12.99 on Amazon. Just click the affiliate link in the description below. It will still be $12.99 for you, but we will get a percentage of the sale, which really helps us out. Plus, it's a really good book. I take it there's going to be quite a few, at least A to Z. Yes, but like I said, it's going to have to be multiple episodes and I'm going to try to use that time because it's easier and faster for me when I need to do more research it's going to take longer than a week. What are we going through today then? We're going through the A's and the B's and I also have this little game for us to play along the way I guess you would say is what it is. As we get to each letter just A and B Come up with ways to die starting with that particular letter of the alphabet. No winners or losers, just for fun. Okay. A is for... Asbestos poisoning. Arsenic. Oh, wow. We both went poisoning. (laughs) Okay. Who won that one? Makes us sound great. I had more syllables. (laughs) It's not a win thing. I don't know. (laughs) I wouldn't have thought about asbestos, though. I'm pretty sure asbestos poisoning is just cancer. So, I guess I could come back to it at sea. Assault. You can die from assault. I think it's considered murder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But never mind. Okay. Mm. Asphyxiation. Asphyxiation. Mm -hmm. Yes. The first one I have is abortion. In the Roman times, magic potions to dispel pregnancies were openly sold. In, I guess, their little markets they had. Uh, Yeah, that sounds about right. During the 17th and 18th century, one in 30 mothers died in childbirth due to exhaustion, dehydration, infection, hemorrhage, and convulsions. Okay, that doesn't sound like a great percentage. No, the average female would give birth eight times in her life. Well, that's rolling the dice every time, so. Each birth, she had a one in eight chance of dying. You know, I would just have the one. Becoming a nun sounds all the more appealing at this point, you know? In the early 19th and 20th centuries, getting pregnant was seen as possible death sentence for either the mother or the unborn child. To prevent pregnancies or to abort, they would massage their stomachs vigorously, jump off of tables, throw themselves down flights of stairs, and use blunt instruments. Have you seen the Family Guy episode? No. They had an abortion clinic. It was it was like Mayflower trip across. And when they got there, this woman it had like a sign that said abortion clinic. And she walked up the stairs. But it's just dead end stairs. She just fell down the other end. <laughs> oh. I shouldn't laugh about things like this. No. But it is family guy. Yeah. It's meant to be funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, the situation is not meant to be funny, but it's funny. I, I don't remember. In certain ways. I, I'm pretty sure South Park has had their own take on it. Probably. Probably something to do with stem cells or baby fetuses. I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure the mad scientist had some baby fetuses. No, the video game had it. That's what it was. There was an abortion clinic and the aliens got a hold of the abortion clinic and made zombie half alien hybrids. I don't remember that. I it, remember turkeys. Yeah, that was not that same video game. Oh, okay. That's why the, I don't remember that. The, the stick of truth. I think I'll send it down for the Switch for you to play sometime. It's a turn it's based. On Switch? It's a turn based game and uh, plays. Some kid that shows up and you could choose Cartman's side or Kyle's side or, or, you know. Okay. From 1850 to 1930, midwives and physicians offered a variety of remedies or recipes for mixtures. They were often lethal to the mother as well as to the fetus. That would solve the pregnancy problem. Yeah. It was illegal to advertise or sell contraception devices. 
these recipes or potions or whatever you want to call them were acceptable, though. I'm guessing they were well worded to cover for that. Well, I don't think you would call that a potion. Recipe would probably be a better word for that. I mean, if they thought it was magic, it's a potion. I don't think they, in 1930, did they think it oh, was magic? No. I've, I've forgotten the date. I don't know. <laughs> oh. An advice column from an 1880 newspaper said to prevent contraception, eat the dry lining of a chicken's gizzard or for three mornings, take b- gum powder in small doses or to put an end to childbearing, throw the afterbirth of the mother's last baby down an old well or walk directly over the spot where the afterbirth was buried. So this sounds... It goes from something that will probably end the pregnancy. You know, it sounds like... It'll end the mother, too. Yeah. At least two of them probably give you food poisoning, if not something worse. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you want to hear about food poisoning. Um, The next one I have is to drink tea made from rusty nail water. I don't know if you can catch tetanus. That way? That way? I wouldn't wouldn't take the chance. (laughs) You know, tetanus is actually from a... Something that lives in the soul, soil. naturally. Yeah. She would also be able to rub her navel with quinine and turpentine each morning and each night for several days to induce an abortion. Now, turpentine does seep into the skin, I'm pretty sure. That is paint remover, correct? I think it's something like that, yeah. And I, I, work, I hear about it, but I've never even thought to. I worked in about. acetone for a while, which was paint remover, mm-hmm. and it would seep through the skin. I think that's in fingernail polish. Well, that is paint, so that would make sense. We had massive barrels of acetone, and there was a guy at work who just wouldn't wear gloves. Well, how'd that turn out for him? Don't know. I'm gone now. I'm not there. I quit. (laughs) OSHA violations. In the 1900s, 100,000 abortions were performed in New York City. 17,300 deaths were a result of these procedures. I take it these aren't done at hospital. I'm not sure. I doubt it was legal at that time. Okay. But I'm not sure. Now we're going to abandoned in a vehicle. Oh, that's been pretty bad lately. Mm, I feel like that's a constant bad thing. March 2001 in Texas, a mother left her five-month-old child in a vehicle while she worked from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. She found the infant lifeless when she returned. During the day, the inside of the vehicle reached up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and she told police that she must have forgotten to drop the baby off at daycare. I remember when this happened. I think there's a book about it. I don't remember. I feel like I've read a book at least similar to this. I mean, it happens all the time. Yeah. I have in my own little thoughts, in my notes, eye roll. It is an eye roll situation, I guess. Forgot to drop it off at daycare. In 2002, 10,000 parents admitted to leaving their children in a car for at least three minutes while running errands. 100 admitted to 30 minutes or more. Oh, my. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a big chance you're taking, even yeah. if, if it's cooler weather. Yeah, because you don't know if somebody's going to break into your car and steal your child or... The car and the child. That's happened more than once. Yeah. In October 2002, a father in Michigan left a two, his two-year-old son in the car to go into a bar. That sounds like something that happened on Shameless. Mm-hmm. 45 minutes later, he returned and the boy was missing. Six days later, the boy was found and had died from hypothermia because it had been freezing and snowing for those six days. So he just walked off the child did. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when you're in a bar for 45 minutes and leave your child in the car. And he was two years old. Looks like somebody would have found the kid. It looks like somebody would have seen it, though. Yeah, just a toddler walking around. Yeah, I seen two very young girls in New Orleans on Bourbon Street. It was past midnight by themselves holding each other's hands. And I was like looking back at them and there was nobody to show that there was any adult that they were with. And I'm like, are you serious? One was really young, just probably just walking. I mean, I guess they knew what they were doing. I guess so. They didn't seem lost. Mm -hmm. The worst case scenario, other than like kidnapping situations, is that their parents are tourists and don't actually know the area and just brought their kids to sit outside a bar. They wouldn't even have to sit outside the bar. You get to take your alcohol out as long as it's not in a glass container. Yeah, I don't know about that situation. That makes it seem even more like they were tourist kids. I don't know. In 2004, 298 children died from being left in hot vehicles. One woman said she left her child in a car while she worked for up to four hours. Her excuse was there was no access to daycare. 
she would leave the window slightly open and provide the child with toys and drinks. But one hot August, the child died of a heat stroke. Um, yeah, you can't do that. She also uh, mentioned that she parked her car where she could see it from her office. But apparently you were not watching very well. How many times did the kid probably just fall asleep while she was in there? So we're moving on to airbags. Airbags were originally developed to protect astronauts in crash landings of spacecrafts. The first crash sensor airbag was invented in 1968. Since 1990, airbags became a standard issue feature in cars. Yep, I remember. The most people to be affected badly by an airbag are short people, infants, and children. Airbags normally save more lives, but they can cause injuries and they can cause death. Some ways are whiplash, eye injuries, including blindness, the outer layer of the skin being peeled to the bone, and death by decapitation. It sounds like they're coming out of their container quicker than they need to. I don't know how it's going to peel the skin. I know they're a rough experience anyway, but if it's peeling the skin to the bone, maybe they you need to fix that. 1999, a 32-year-old six-foot man was driving home from a Halloween party. He went around a slippery turn and his car veered off of the road. The car's front end bumped to a hull against a wall, causing the airbag to deploy. The autopsy showed the man had been sucking on a lollipop when the airbag hit his face, causing him to choke to death on the lollipop. He should have had one of those child-friendly ones with the hole in the center. Yeah. I've thought about it while I've had a lollipop and thinking, I I don't trust myself with this. I should probably get one of the child-friendly ones. (laughs) Alligators. Sounds like a common way to go as well. Yeah. In the summer of 2004, a 20-year-old woman was skinny dipping in Fort Myers, Florida. Her arm was bitten off by an alligator, which caused her death. Well, that's sad. Yes. So young. Mm -hmm. August 2004, a 74-year-old woman was gardening near a bank in Florida. She got bitten by an alligator, 10-foot-long alligator, on the leg and the arm. Then it dragged her into the lake, causing her death. That sounds about right. Mm Mm-hmm. You, uh, you got bit on the leg and arm, and then you got drug into a lake. That's going to get you. In July 2004, in the same community as the 74-year-old woman, a 54-year-old female landscape worker bent over to fertilize. A 12-foot weighing 457-pound alligator latched onto her head. And I have a new rule if I ever go back to Florida. Never bent over to do anything, because that's how the little boy in the amusement park one died. Yeah. Don't bend over. You should probably always keep an eye out on your surroundings, but look around you. Don't when, don't bend over. <laughs> when we went to Florida, I don't remember seeing more than one, but I know they were there. Um, Wasn't there one on the interstate yeah, or as soon highway? Yeah, as, as soon as we crossed into Florida, we seen one. Yeah. But that's about the only one we seen. Well, in May 2006, a 28-year-old female was out jogging in Broward County, Florida. 400-pound alligator snatched her in a mid-step and killed her. People like these scenic areas to run or exercise or garden, when in fact, you probably shouldn't be near those scenic areas. Maybe not. Or like I said, just try to keep an eye on your surroundings. Not that that will help every time, but They've evolved to be hidden in the water. And yeah, that's what I was also thinking about the bending over thing, because they're always waiting for animals to bend over and get a drink of water. But it seems as if alligators usually only choose the most fleshy parts of already deceased human bodies to eat. Okay. July 2003, the body of a 70-year-old man was found in a pond in Venice, Florida. An eight-foot alligator was swimming around nearby, and the man had been missing for days. The body was still 25% intact, only partially eaten by the alligators. I wonder if they killed him. Didn't say. I don't know. Hmm. That or drowning, I would think. But he was 70 years old. Yeah, it could have been anything, and they just found him. I wonder if they're carrion creatures. I feel like they like live things better, but in Stewart, Florida... A teenager tried to hide from the police by hiding in a pond. Let me guess. Something else found him. He was found five days later. Only the buttocks and abdomen were missing. So you're saying he was like... He had a big old booty. Oh. (laughs) They just ate that part. (laughs) Oh, that's awful. Yeah. That and the abdomen. Looks like the police would have heard him. Maybe he got drug under quickly and he never screamed because he was underwater. Um, he was in the pond to hide. Okay, then. Yeah, he's, he's drowned. Yeah. 
Moving on to amnesia. July to August 2003, near Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, a large group of people, well, large groups of people, developed amnesia. Some sort of poisoning? People sat out in cars and suddenly forgot which was the brake pedal and which was the gas. Blinking traffic lights weren't understood, causing many head-on collisions. Some left their houses, then couldn't remember where they lived. One man shot a neighbor that walked into the wrong house accidentally because he couldn't remember where he lived. Biologists eventually found the amnesia was caused by microscopic organisms found in river estuaries, and they were found during the red tide blooms. So the red tide causes amnesia. If you're around it, yes, apparently so. In the 1950s, amnesia was treated with electric shock therapy. Oh, that'll make everything better. Oh, yes. Good old electric shock therapy. Fixes everything. I wonder how many lobotomies resulted in this mess, too. I don't know. Hmm. 1957, 247 people died from electric shock treatment. Electrodes (laughs) are strapped to the head. A current of 140 to 170 volts blasts into the brain at one second intervals in hopes of returning the brain to a normal function, usually causing more memory loss than it helps. Yes, it's like not death. It's like a small dose of the executioner's chair. It is. Now we're going to ants. In 1998 in Jackson, Mississippi, a 68 year old nursing home resident was taken in her wheelchair outside for fresh air and left unattended. The wheelchair had disturbed a nest belonging to a colony of fire ants on the lawn. Fire ants swarmed over her body, and during the next hour, she was bitten hundreds of times, causing her death two days later. That must have been one of the worst ways to go. I would think so. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say that the fire ants belong in like the family of bees and wasps with their venom. I've seen them a few times when we were down south. Never got too close to them. Oh, another thing is she had Alzheimer's. Is that how you say it? Alzheimer's? Yep. Yeah. So. Poor thing. Yeah. Did they just not even hear her scream or did she bother screaming? It's hard to. I don't know. I would, but I don't know if she was. Quite as coherent at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When an entire colony is triggered into massive attacks, the concentration of venom is toxic. Many people are hypoallergenic. To simply one bite, troubles for sensitive people when bitten can cause chest pains, nausea, dizziness, shock, coma, and death. That's an unpleasant list of side effects. That is a (laughs) lot of side effects. A lot of side effects. I wouldn't want to go through any of it. No. I'd be shocked if my way of going was ants. Ants. No, I don't want to go that way. I don't want bees or wasps either to take me out. Now we're going to aphrodisiacs. I bet there's a lot of them in a humiliating way to go. Yes, I only have a few, but yes, there were many. In 2001, in New York, four men ages between 28 to 34 bought aphrodisiacs from a smoke shop. They thought the brown sugar-shaped cubes were supposed to be dissolved in hot water and sipped like a tea. So they drank one cup after another. It's really supposed to be made into a paste and rubbed on appropriate areas. Within 30 minutes, they suffered severe vomiting and diarrhea. A day later, they died. I mean, at the age of 28 to 34, shouldn't even be bothering using it. I can only imagine the shop they bought this from. It didn't explain it very well. Surely it would have some sort of instructions on it. I've been to places where you can get natural cures for things and such. Until recently, that wasn't a thing. You could just... I feel like there should definitely always be some sort of instructions for yeah. things like that. I'm almost positive that vitamins and things don't have to follow the same rules as actual medications. But with certain vitamins, you can still have too much of that and die. Certain yeah. ones, especially. I've seen, I've seen that on a house. Yes, I've been watching it. That's how I know. It's, I, I'm pretty sure it's true. Yeah, I trust house. Popular medical history podcast mm-hmm. Sawbones tells me that vitamins aren't usually necessary unless prescribed by a doctor in the U.S. because everything we have is fortified. Mm-hmm. I hear people talking about all the vitamins they take, and I say to myself, but why? But I don't ask, because they usually tell me why. When I wasn't eating meat, I tried to take iron vitamins. Vitamins. Yes, vitamins. But they made me sick, so I stopped. That would be the wise choice. But there's also these vitamins, all-purpose vitamins or something, over there. And it's got many different, multivitamin, that's what it's called. Those also made me sick. I don't know why. Maybe you so shouldn't I take gave vitamins. up on vitamins. Yeah, don't take vitamins. I guess it's for some people and 
not for others. There's like everything in Mickey's Sick because they're literally in everything we eat now. I don't know. The late 1960s, a U.S. law stated that toads may not be licked. I don't have any impulse <laughs> to break that rule. Why does that even have to be a law? Kids and teenagers wanting to get high. Who was the first person to pick up a toad and lick it? I like The Princess and the Frog, even before Disney made it a much better movie. I liked it, but I had no thoughts of, you know what I should do? I should go make out with a frog. I should go sexually assault a frog. No. So I don't get it, but y'all out there making us look bad and stupid. That's another thing at South Park. I try not to be offensive, but you're making us look stupid. I think South Park and Family Guy have all made fun of that as well. Even American Gods, like the first episode, they mentioned synthetic toad skin vape pens. Okay. In the early 1950s, the government researchers injected inmates in Ohio with this particular toad's venom. They were hoping to gain insights into schizophrenia and other mental disorders. But what they got were inmates experiencing hallucinations, nausea, chest pains, turning the color of an eggplant. Purple. Mm-hmm. And being abnormally affectionate with one another and towards the researchers. I mean, that last one doesn't sound all bad. <laughs> I don't know if affectionate can mean like... Only if... Bad. It bad. depends on the affection, I would assume. Yeah. That could be and a polite if, way if of saying there's worse. consent... Yeah, that could be a polite thing, way of saying something much worse, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, some that are into this interesting, strange thing say that they would rather smoke a whole toad to extract the venom in a large crack pipe. No, 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 no. I'm not burning a poor little toad. That's what I was thinking. Poor little innocent toads can't even use their venom to protect themselves like they should because some of us humans just have to go licking and smoking everything just to give it a try. That's not for me. Arsenic. That sounds like time for common... Time for some arsenic. We, we licked toads and smoked toads and now it's arsenic time. Arsenic is easy to find. It's available and made in... Apple seeds? Yes, actually it is. From what I hear. Also cherry seeds, because I was told not to eat too many cherry pits. It's in a lot of stuff. Um, I think it's in soil, some water. It's in a lot of natural elements. It's easy to find. It's the number one choice for poisoning, because it can be added to food without much of the taste being affected. Women prefer using arsenic to murder. I want to say that I've heard it either smells like almonds or it has a slight almond taste. Almondy taste, taste, yes. Almondy taste. I've watched Doctor Who. The Big B episode? Yes. Yes. Poor Donna. Women who are caught more than once killing with arsenic or poison in general are called black widows. Marie Holly poisoned eight people, including her husband, daughter, and mother-in-law in the state of Alabama with arsenic. From 1979 to 1983, she fed her family the arsenic. And I've seen that it was because she simply got tired of her life. She got bored. I watched a true crime thing about a lady who went on an arsenic spree. Was it Nanny Hazel Doss? I don't remember. Okay. In 1987, she was found because she was out on furlough. They found her dead of hypothermia, and she was buried next to the husband that she murdered. I think this is the same woman. Husband, daughter, mother-in-law, and she poisoned at least eight, it said. So it might be. Mm-hmm. I want to say, if it's the one I'm thinking about, they might have found out how she was doing it because one of her daughters didn't die and she was in the hospital. That's the one that I told you they arrested her when she was poisoning her daughter. Nanny Hazel Doss, also called the Giggling Grandma. It sounds like that dentist from Little Shop of Horrors. Between 1920 and 1954 in Oklahoma, she killed with arsenic four husbands, two kids, two sisters, her mother, grandson, and nephew and that's all the book said but i feel like she might have killed some others or maybe i'm just mixing it up with the other one i'm probably mixing it up with the other one either way grandson and nephew that's quite a list there lady four husbands they didn't they must two be, of her own kids why would she get married so quickly probably money um, uh, how why would people well, marry no, actually this one i want to say it wasn't money it i think this one was just just because for the enjoyment, maybe? Yeah, your nephew? Your grandson. I mean, the nephew's an odd one. But th- she's called the giggling granny because when she was making her confession, she said it 
so cheerfully. Huh, 1954. Uh, maybe there's a video of her. And she looked her. like a sweet old lady, like just a sweet grandma. I'd like to see a video of her. I bet there's a video of her. It happened in 1920 to 1954. 1954, they had cameras, Beth. How do you think we had videos of the Great War? I, didn't, I, I don't know. She wanted to collect the life insurance, or at least she did collect the life insurance. I mean, why wouldn't she? Even if it wasn't about money, that's a waste. It also sounds like it'd be easier to get caught. Don't trust anybody that puts life insurance on you. Some places you don't have to know. They don't even have to sign off of it. You could just get it like an insurance on somebody. That is not safe. That mm -hmm. is not good. That's how this happened so often back then. In 1965, she died of leukemia. Oh, well, they didn't execute her? Looks like they'd execute her. Now, apparently the leukemia got her. I feel... She definitely probably deserved execution after that many people, and all relatives, too. I don't know. I'm not all for the execution thing. You never know when there's going to be a mistake. That is true. Very true. We should do an episode on the mistakes. I looked some up the other day out of an idea for that. I need to start taking down these ideas. Mm -hmm. Make a book and... I'm not writing a book. No, not write a book. Make one of those good notes notebooks, and whenever you see it, just jot it down in that notebook and share it with me. I can look through it. I use Google because GoodNotes well, fine, messes up Google. all my stuff. Okay. Auto castration is next. Why would they do that? A couple of different reasons. Is there a Roman? Yes. I knew they would be. I put the Roman part in here, but we'll see. Oh. Can't remember. But there was a lot more in that book than what I put down oh. as well. Okay. Purchase the book. <laughs> yeah, the book. It's good. Many ancient cultures throughout history not only accepted auto castration, but sometimes encouraged it. I heard a podcast called Hysterical History where they was discussing the emperor of China's eunuchs. I have China in here. Oh, cool. I don't think I have that specific detail in that, but I want to say it's China, I believe. But let me get there. Removing one's own testicles is called eunuchs. I just said that. Yes, I know. But I had that in my notes and okay. lost track of where I was. Young male slaves with smaller bodies or smaller built would willingly cut off their testicles. And this is where I believe it was in ancient China, Middle East, and Mediterranean societies. Not sure, but I believe that's where it was. It was a way to escape the life of hard labor that the more masculine strong men endured. I don't know if I'd be able to do that. Mm -mm. Just to be... Well, no, because they still had to do some work, just yeah. not the more physical. Yes, you take notes for the emperor. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, I would want that job, but I don't know if I'd be able to do this, given I don't have testicles, but still, I feel like it, it's probably painful to do that. Maybe they had like opium or something. I don't know. Eunuchs were assigned to protect and care for the women of the house because they were believed to not be interested in sex. I don't know. All I know is what Ga uh, Game of Thrones told me, and I don't know if that's true, so. I don't know either. I suppose we could educate If anybody ourselves. knows, email us. They often became trusted servants. For the emperors. Mm. Mulan, that dude yeah, who's Mulan. like, who's like, general. Oh. <laughs> that makes sense. I don't know if it's the way it's supposed to be, but now I know more. Think about it. It makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, now that a childhood Disney movie is ruined for you. In 2003... A 26-year-old married man with a history of sexual abuse and pedophilic... Pedophilic behavior? Is that what you're trying to say? Pedophilic behavior became extremely religious. I mean, if anybody needs to find Jesus, perhaps mm. it is the child molesters. Yeah, but I feel like some of them that have found Jesus... Did, just relapsed immediately and kept Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. During the first five years of his marriage, he reported hearing sounds, displayed unpredictable violence, and inappropriate mood swings. He completely severed his scrotum at the base and flung the testes about 30 yards away into some bushes in a field. That's he was how, in the field when he did it. Oh, well, that's how Aphrodite was born, except she landed in the sea and came up as sea foam and then turned into the most beautiful goddess of love. Mm. After his body was discovered, it was found that he had not harmed his penis at all. But he did die of blood loss in the field. I'd which that. That's fine, because you were not a great person. You weren't even a good person. So it's fine with me. More of them need to do that themselves. Now the fun stuff. Autoerotic asphyxiation. Asphyxiation. That is hard to say together. Brian Kenny. <laughs> you remember that he episode? He called it scarfing. Yeah. <laughs> Lack of oxygen leads to lightheadedness, which magnifies 
sexual experiences. It is achieved usually by hanging, or as Brian Kenny calls it, scarfing, because he uses silk scarves, strangulation or suffocation. We are not endorsing this. You should not try this. No, Anyone people to... do die. Quite a bit of people do die. Yeah, think about the name of this book and then decide before you jump into that or off of something. Be cautious. Don't do it. Don't do it at all. But Can't recommend you do this. There Simple. you go. References are found in medieval European documents and ancient oriental sex guides about this. 2003, eight women died hanging naked from a rope-like contraption that was sold in ex- exotic shops. I don't know if they still sell these in exotic shops. I don't remember the last time I was in one. Nashville, maybe? I, I don't remember either. It had a padding to prevent neck bruises and chafing, so that's definitely what it was for. It didn't prevent death, which is the most important part. No, not for <laughs> Not for those eight. But I want to say, if I remember correctly, what I read, it also said that there was either a warning label or some sort of instructions of how to get down safely. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. Always read the instructions before using. Yes. Especially something like that. It also said electric rope-like contraption, but I didn't put that down because why was it electric? There's a whole electric kink as well. Um, oh no, I don't want that. Not just that, but maybe I it was on like a, of electricity. Maybe it was on like a pulley. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You just press the button and you're slowly hung oh. to death. Well, why don't they make that? It feels like that would take so long, though. <laughs> Especially if the cheap motors those things like would have to have. Oh, you just press goodness. the button. Anybody who's <laughs> using an electric motor to move something like a, a winch knows how slow it'd go. <laughs> I mean, if it just went 100 miles an hour, that wouldn't be great either. <clears throat> Wee! <laughs> no, it's more like snap. <laughs> Maybe that was the problem. Uh, malfunction. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! The button oh, stuck. Oh no! It is oh, really no. sad for these people, but you have to admit that if you think about certain things in ways, that that's kind of funny. In two thousand four, one thousand two hundred fourteen reported people died attempting to constrict blood flow to the brain during sexual activities. Most of these were adolescent males. Oh no. And that's just the ones that were reported. Some of them, they say it might have happened more and they just weren't reported that way. When did Brian Kenny do his episode? I don't know. Makes you wonder if his episode was based on this or if they were based on the episode. I don't know. I have them on DVD. There's also cocooning, which is a method to restrict. Restrict? Restrict airflow for optimal sexual experiences using cellophane or plastic wrap, things like that. I know someone who has discussed that. In 2002, Portland, Maine, a man enclosed his body in plastic to create a cocoon. He had an airway using a small diver's snorkel, but while doing his business, his teeth lost grip of the snorkel. And then he suffocated. How was he planning on escaping in the first place? When his body was found, it was seen that he made attempts to slice himself free with a knife. So apparently he had a knife for that. But he failed and he died. Yeah. As soon as the air is cut off, you have like a minute or so to. That just sounds like too much work for me. Did he just stand up and wrap himself? I don't know how he did it. I I can't understand how he himself did it. No, I don't know. Not not for me. How did he not have help at least getting wrapped up? I don't know. Anyway, yeah, that sounds like way too much work. I guess the being. And a waste of plastic wrap because you don't want to cook with it afterward. Uh, Now, Beth. Don't tell them what they do and don't want to do. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Some people might actually probably want to cook with it afterward so you or keep their food wrapped up in it. You won't but... have to salt the mashed potatoes. The plastic wrap will take care of that. <laughs> Instant salted plastic wrap. All, all the wrap. sweat is just going to seep. <laughs> it help to keep it more fresh. Ew. Okay. Pre-preservative plastic wrap. <laughs> We've made it to the bees. <laughs> Not actual bees, like the letter B. So B is for? B is for barium poisoning. Okay, you're going to win this one. Oh, I know it will kill you. Well, you didn't even come up with a B. Well, I was waiting for you to finish telling me what that was. Okay. Um, I, Mine's a little more simple. Beat the bitch with a bat. Bat beatings. Both are bees. Mm-hmm. But that's murder. Bubonic plague or black death. There you go. Okay. Not completely original since we have an episode about it, but it'll do. But it's my favorite. Barbecues. New York. Staten Island. 1988. A 50-year-old man lived in a basement efficiency apartment, and he set up a small charcoal grill on his kitchen counter next to a hot plate and lit it. 
Maybe the hot plate would have been just fine by itself. Charcoal has that special taste. They make a smoking liquid now. They also have a seasoning, but I don't know if it's the same. Well, no. One, I, one's a spice and one's a liquid. Well, I meant I don't know if it actually tastes like it came from a charcoal grill. I would prefer not charcoal. It's too much effort. I don't it like, does have yeah. a little bit of a different flavor to the food, but I would rather just make it easy. I'm lazy. I bought my mother, our mother, a Blackstone griddle thing. Her outside grill. She cooks on that all the time. Mm. Well, this caused a lot of smoke in his house, well, his basement apartment, which he thought he could just open the small basement window to help out with I, that. I lived in a basement, and I don't think that would work. Apparently, he really enjoyed his grilled food. I feel like he probably could have went on the street and done it. This could be under smoke inhalation. It's After more than a month of this, he died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Wow, he must have really enjoyed it. Yeah. After you know, it had a stain, too. We, we've had wood stoves in our homes before. Mm-hmm. And they and leave soot everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Because we because it's smoke. Yeah. A house catches on fire, it's going to leave a mess. Yeah. Even if it's well ventilated, some of it gets out when you open the stove door. Mm-hmm. He didn't have a stove door. He had a grill top. So mm-hmm. he had a fireplace without proper ventilation is what he had. Yeah. In 1929, in the South Pole, Richard Everlyn Bird was on an Antarctic excursion where he would barbecue in his tent i wouldn't go outside in the arctic either but i'm not gonna barbecue in my tent that's a horrible fire hazard i don't know nothing about the 1920s exploration scene um, so what did they what kind of gadgets do they have clearly not a working grill or barbecue stand or whatever that they used back then a fire pit well he nearly died of carbon monoxide poisoning but after years of exposure to the fumes when he barbecued, he developed cancer and died at age 69 in 1957. I always wondered how healthy it was to burn incense and candles and stuff like that. They make candles out of beeswax and materials like that that's supposed to be a little bit better, but I'm... I mean, it's still smoke. Yeah, it's still smoke. So I don't know how that... I do it. I burn incense. Dragon blood. When I go somewhere and find dragon's blood incense sticks, I buy bundles of the things. And I think to myself... Is this just a less regulated cigarette that I'm using without the nicotine? I don't know. In 2003, barbecuing caused 203 incident-related deaths. That's a lot of people. There's also quite a few children that are injured during barbecues. Explosions and burnings. I would Tipping assume. over the thing and Papa beating him in the head of something. Bats is next. Huh. Cute little bats. Okay. Well, I guess some of them can be big. There's a type that's big. A fruit bat? They're the big ones, right? The one like on Fungully? Yeah. Batty? Mm-hmm. I love Fungully. Yeah. Second one wasn't that bad either. In September 15, 1999, in California, a bat flew into a 49-year-old man's house. So you do what everybody does. If there's a bat besides me and I call you and I'm like, yo, there's a bat in my house, you better come do your big brother duty and get it out. He decided ch- to chase it around. Until it flew out. But it bit him. Because he pissed it off. Chasing it around. Yeah. The next day, he began experiencing hypersal... I have trouble with this one. Hypersalivation. He drools. Hypersalivation. Uncontrollable muscle twitching. Confusion. And he tried to bite his wife. Did he become afraid of water? It didn't say that, but it sounds like he should have. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he just got rabies. It said she took him to the hospital and within five days after contract, after five days from contact with the bat, he died from kidney failure. Does rabies give you kidney failure? It might. I feel like he definitely had rabies and it probably was an effect of that because you don't want to drink water. Doesn't your kidneys? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Kind of. In Utah, a 44-year-old who liked to go camping without a tent was bitten by a bat. For three weeks, he experienced sore throat, fever, chills, and weakness. A lot less drastic than the other guy. Yeah. He developed encephalitis from the bat with rabies that had bitten him, and he died. What is encephalitis? I remember looking it up, but I don't remember. I should have wrote it down. An inflammation of the brain usually caused due to infection that causes flu-like symptoms. So, yeah. It was rabies. I've heard of that a lot more than I hear rabies. Building I mean, debris kills people, too. Mm-hmm. In 1989, 
In Chicago, a man was being kept awake by his cat, well, not his cats, by random cats, on his apartment building roof. He opened the window, sat on the windowsill, then shot up at them with an air gun in hopes of scaring them away. He was successful. He did get to enjoy it for a little bit, not very long. A piece of rusted cornice broke off and hit him in the head, causing him to fall from the windowsill and to his death. Now, what are the odds in that happening? That's what you get for being mean to the kitty cats. Yeah, I Never like cats. fuck with a feline. In Chicago 2003, a backyard deck pulled loose from a building, killing 12 people. In Montana in 2004, a deck collapsed at a casino, killing 52 people. Avoid Sounds decks like, and casinos. Yeah. Or decks in general. I'm afraid of heights. Sounds like Final Destination. That's 52 people that a deck killed. Yeah. I'm afraid of heights. And the only time I've been on one that I haven't been worried about is on a cruise. Because I assume if it falls, I'll probably survive the fall. Mm. And, and they'll certainly notice the falling and I won't be left behind. I'm afraid of heights. But like I said in the earlier episode, if I'm on a deck or the cruise or something like that, I'm fine. But I'm not good just on a rope. Like those rope walk things you can do in Gatlinburg, I can't even do that. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Who even I? though I know it's safe, I just, I cannot do that. I don't trust myself. Even though I know I have the rope thing to help, I cannot do it. I freeze when it comes to that. I say deck on the cruise. I mean balconies. Balcony, yeah. Because they, I'm pretty much substituting balcony in my head every time I read this. <laughs> There's also buried alive. There's little grave bells, mm-hmm. ding, 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 ding. Yeah, I didn't put that in here, but yes, they did have those. In the 1800s, being buried alive was fairly common due to physicians periodically pronouncing unconscious people dead, causing groups to get together called, citizen groups called Society of the Prevention of People Being Buried Alive. It just rolls off the tongue. They advised the deceased to be left in their caskets for days or weeks before being considered actually dead. To be buried. Sounds safe if that's happening so often. Some of them said wait for decomposing to start before burying them as well. But they're going to starve before then if they're not dead. You know, maybe they'll die. Well, they will be. Yeah. So around 1895, newspapers documented during funeral services people, the deceased suddenly sitting up, screaming for help, which obviously startled the people during the service because the dead person just screams and sits up. There's also reports of women giving birth while in their coffins. That's not terribly surprising. I've heard that that can happen. Yeah. Nowadays, they would try to save the baby, I'm thinking. Before, I would hope so. even bother with the burial. Yeah. Grave robbers were reported opening casket lids to find a person blinking at them. It's paralyzed for some reason. It's the 1800s. Who knows? Yeah. There's it could have ki- been anything. All kinds of chemicals and everything you get. In 1817, physicians were advised to perform the sphincter test to confirm death. Let me guess. They, um, an enema, perhaps? No. A tube would be inserted in the mouth of the deceased. Oh. Then they would squeeze on a balloon-like bladder to force a shot of air into the throat. One person held the nose and lips, while another waited near the corpse's ass if the air blast shot out of the anus with a clap it meant that the sphincter muscle had lost its contractibility and the person was then considered deceased a clap pretty much a fart is what it sounds like to me make it a corpse fart i think of like a bag catching in the wind <laughs> you know that, that that thump it makes when you shake a plastic bag or a trash mm-hmm. bag open i wonder if you got demoted to be the person at the rear end area. It's, you're the person that people don't like. New guy or something. Yeah. Now you sit down here. <laughs> this, your job is to sit at the end of this table. <laughs> and listen very closely. Here's a stethoscope. <laughs> <laughs> From 1750 to 1920, about 5,950 people were buried alive. That's a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, for the, no wonder they had to get citizen groups together to try to prevent this. I wouldn't want to take a chance, but I wouldn't want people I cared about to be the people having to wait around me or certainly doing the tests, apparently. 
I've never been afraid of being buried alive. I'm sure if I was about to be, I would be afraid. Yeah. I read about it, but I've never really gave it much thought. It's I feel like it's a lot less likely to happen nowadays. I mean, there was a lady who woke up in the morgue the other day, like last month or so, two months ago. I wonder how she felt. Lucky or terribly unlucky? Very confused, I'd imagine. And that's all I have. Well, we got through A and B. Mm -hmm. Beth and I also have another podcast called Brother Knows Quest. It's where I try to explain different tabletop role-playing games to her, usually the settings. The first episode, we tried to cover D&D. The next one, we tried to cover Savage Worlds. It wasn't easy because Savage Worlds is a generic setting, which has no real setting. You just... Make up your own setting. Yeah, so there wasn't much... I didn't want to just read off a list of rules, so... Use your imagination. (laughs) My friend Dakota and I do another podcast called Leveling Duo. It's a podcast where we discuss our good times we've had playing games since we were young and some of the newer ones as well. Video games mostly. But you can find all of our podcasts at the link in the description below. As well as the Amazon affiliate link that has the book that I mentioned earlier. If you don't want the book and you just want to leave a tip, any of the podcasts in that link below, if you click on the take me to their website, there is a tip option. There's one for Horrific History and Hauntings. We don't really ask for money, but if you want to, that'd be nice. We do have to pay to keep the podcast keep the podcast up so it really does yeah. help out also if you have any questions or any ideas for episodes or if i've got something wrong and you would like to respectfully let me know so i can fix it in a different episode please let me know at horrific history dot hauntings at gmail.com i have a twitter to cover all of our podcasts it's called the Gruesome Gaming Group, but the Twitter is Gruesome Gaming G. So that's the Twitter handle. If you want to find us there, you can message me or follow us, and I'll try to post information about new episodes and stuff like that. Thanks for listening. I've been Ramey. I'm Beth. Bye bye. <laughs>